So um, I'm going to talk about management of pulmonary embolism. And one of the things that I'm going to include here is our data from Baltimore, from Maryland. So, and I think that's why this is very uh, important. So I start as a director of the pulmonary embolism uh, response team in 2017. Uh, so there's a lot of changes that you can see that occur uh, during that time. And I'm going to show you what we uh, have already. So I have no disclosures. Um, so we know that uh, venous thromboembolism affects about three to 600,000 patients a year in the United States. We, if we're talking about pulmonary embolism, 10% of the pulmonary embolism are rapidly fatal. So they kill you right away. About 5%, uh, they kill you during the hospitalization, you know, and is the third leading cause of, mortal of cardiovascular mortality in the United States. And about three to 5% of the patients develop chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. That is an, uh, a late complications of pulmonary embolism. So um, what happened here in Baltimore, in, in the University of Maryland? So when I start here, I start doing a, basically a chart review of, of what kind of patients we have. So, and we saw that we, uh, we, we diagnosed with about 769 patients uh, at the University of Maryland during two years. So, so this is a large volume of patients, but a lot of those patients were admitted with a different um, diagnosis, and then they were found to have a, a pulmonary embolism. Not all of them were, that was the cause of the admission. And if we see, there was a lot of people uh, that had a, like a recent trauma, 16%, uh, that had some recent surgery, 32%, uh, 25, 26% of them have cancer. But what is very unique about our area is that we have almost 50, 50, 40, you know, between Caucasian and African-American. So that makes our area unique. If you read any other cohorts uh, in the United States, uh, usually uh, Caucasian is about 80, 90% of the cohort. In our area is almost 50-50. So uh, what, how the PERT work, you know, we receive a, a, a consult from in the hospital, from inside the hospital, but also we receive referrals from other hospitals. So from 2019 to 2020, we uh, received 97 requests for transfers, but we only, only accept about 60% of the transfers. Um, and those are the hospitals that usually request for transfers. Most of these hospitals are within the University of Maryland medical system, uh, but we also receive even uh, um, you know, from, from other hospitals too. So whenever we talk about a pulmonary embolism, we have to talk about what are the risk factors uh, and why pulmonary embolism happen. So I always say this is a balance between procoagulant and anticoagulant um, factors. So in usually you can have some inherited risk factors and acquired risk factors. In the inherited risk factors, you have factor five lighting that is the most common one among Caucasian uh, patients uh, that affects about 5% of the Caucasian population. Also prothrombin G mutation affects about um, three to 5% of the Caucasian population. Factor five lighting, this is a common mistake that I always read in the notes. Um, is a resistant to one of the anticoagulant system that is a protein C and protein A, protein C basically. So the factor five itself has a mutation that did not accept protein C uh, as an anticoagulant. Um, so also you can have patients who have a deficit of protein C and protein A's, uh, uh, deficits of antitromin, those are anti the anticoagulant system. In African American, that is what we see in this area, you know, that in this cohort, uh, we have also elevated factor eight. Sometimes we have patients that uh, you do all this workup is negative and then you check for factor eight and the activity of factor eight is about 400. You know, uh, you have patients with sickle cell trait, sickle cell disease, they also have an increased risk of having uh, venous uh, thrombosis and you have elevated homocysteine. Um, you have several mutations of M M MTHFR if, if I'm sorry, and um, this is not a strong, strong risk factor for uh, a thrombosis, you know, just recently discovered, but we still consider it as a risk factor. And then we have, in the, on the other hand, acquired risk factors for um, 
for venous thromboembolism. As I show in the, in the previous slides, you know, you have cancer, hospitalization, uh, surgery. Surgery itself can increase up to 20% your risk, I'm sorry, 20 folds your risk of uh, venous thromboembolism. You have trauma, you have air travel. Now we have COVID-19 infection, uh, antiphospholipid antibodies and malignancies, um, et cetera. So we have multiple uh, things that we have to think about venous thromboembolism. And as I say, this is a balance between, between procoagulants and anticoagulant factors. So then, uh, how much these inherited uh, thrombophilias can increase your risk of thrombosis? If we see, you know, factor five, a heterozygous, that is what most of the people has, increase between three to four uh, times, you know, the risk of thrombosis. Uh, if you have a homozygous, it's way more. But if you have a combined factor V lighting plus prothrombin gene mutation, it goes up to 20 times. Uh, but this is really rare. You, you, don't, you don't see that very often. And also you can have uh, anti-thrombin deficiency that is very, uh, very, very, very rare also that increase up to 16 times, you know. Antiphospholipid antibodies we see quite often, but it's between two to 11 times, you know, uh, the risk of thrombosis. So what happened when somebody has a pulmonary embolism? You have the pulmonary embolism, you increase the pressure in the right ventricle because you increase your pressure, there is an increase in wall tension. Uh, then because there is an increase in uh, myocardial uh, oxygen demand in the right ventricle, um, then you can develop ischemia uh, of the right ventricle plus minus infarction. You develop hypokinesia and dilated right ventricle. Also, you develop uh, hypoperfusion of the coronary arteries. You have a decreased preload of the left ventricle, and then you develop uh, systemic uh, hypotension, and patients start getting dizzy, shortness of breath, uh, et cetera. Um, but the mortality is directly linked to this. And um, when we have a patient that comes, uh, shows up to you with a normal blood pressure, you know, the mortality is quite low. It's about 2%. But if you have a patient that comes to the hospital and uh, is in hypotensive, or even you're required to give CPR in those patients, the mortality can go up to 65%. So the clinical presentation is very important for this. Diagnosis, how you make the diagnosis. So then we have a multiple test. I'm sorry for the busy slide, but you have multiple scores that is telling you what is your pre-test probability to have a pulmonary embolism. But basically all those scores include a history, clinical presentation and symptoms of the patient, you know, and depending on the score that you use, they tell you, you have to, to do uh, some biomarkers, like in the GERS score, they also go for the D-dimer. And then you say, okay, you ordered a, a, a CTA. So in our area, I think if anybody has a suspicion of a patient can have a pulmonary embolism, they just ordered a CTA. And CTA basically is the gold standard, is the gold standard for uh, the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. They, now with the new CT scans that we have, you can even diagnose subsegmental pulmonary embolism. What is the problem with CTA that sometimes we have is in patients that has any allergy to iodine or if the patient has some uh, acute kidney injury or chronic uh, um, a renal uh, failure, you cannot expose the patients to iodine contrast. So then you can use a ventilation or perfusion scan or VQ scan, and you can see the areas of mismatch. How is the ventilation perfusion scan done? You ask the patient to inhale xenon gas, and also you inject um, radio label al albumin. So, and then you put the patient in the camera camera, and then you get pictures of the perfusion and the ventilation phases. And then you compare both and see if there's a mismatch defect. Um, then let's say you cannot do neither one. You don't have a nuclear medicine or you cannot do a CT scan. You can also do an echocardiogram. And if in the echocardiogram, you find that the patient has signs of right ventricular strain or dilatation or dysfunction, you can think about pulmonary embolism. Also, you have to do a venous duplex ultrasound of the lower extremities. If the patient has an acute blood clot, 
you know, give you or increase your suspicion of pulmonary embolism. And regardless of, of you know, if the patient has or not, if the patient has a DVT, you have to treat the patient. Uh, you can do an EKG in the EKG. You can have, uh, you know, the most common sign is, is sinus tachycardia, uh, but you can have a new right bundle branch block or some STT changes that can, you can think about a pulmonary embolism. Uh, you can have a chest X-ray, you know, the most common chest X-ray is a normal chest X-ray, uh, but that could be an exclusion criteria that other pathologies like a, a pleural effusion or pneumonia is occurring in this patient. Uh, there's few signs like a, a oligoemia sign or the, you know, but those are really rare and rarely seen in the, in the chest X-ray. An elevated D-dimer uh, is a, a good test that indicates that you have some kind of blood clot in your body. So it could be um, arterial, venous, etc. cetera. Uh, it's not specific for pulmonary embolism. The problem that the dimer is also elevated in other pathologies, let's say if you have cancer, if you have a recent surgery, um, if you have fever, you know, everything can elevate the dimer. So it's not specific. You can check for biomarkers of myocardial injury, you know, um, uh, the troponin, the ProBMP can give you some idea. And also we use that for stratification that I'm going to uh, tell you later. And whenever you have a, uh, I'm going to call severe PE, later I'm going to call massive PE uh, or submassive PE, you can check biomarkers of hypoperfusion, lactate. Uh, that helps a lot in the stratification of the patient as well. So, but we have to uh, think that every time that we talk about pulmonary embolism is not only the size of the clot, you know, it's also the cardiovascular reserve. So I put as, as an example, Serena Williams, she had, I think like two or three episodes of pulmonary embolism and she still is completely functional. She is still able to play. I think she just retired, you know, but uh, she was able to do a, a, a top uh, sport lady. Uh, so because she has a great cardiovascular reserve and that's why, you know, Whenever we're talking about classification, we're going to talk about the American Heart Association clinical classification of pulmonary embolism. In any of these uh, categories that we talk here, we talk about size of the clot burden. So we always talk about clinical presentation. And we have a patient that comes with a massive pulmonary embolism and patient has a sustained hypotension for more than 15 minutes. It's not responding to IV fluids. You know, you give one, two liters, the patient do not respond. Uh, patient usually require vasopressure and you cannot find any other causes of this. And also patient can present with pulses, electrical activity uh, and bradycardia and signs of shock. That is a patient that has a massive pulmonary embolism. Then on the other side, you have the patient that has a low risk pulmonary embolism. It's a patient basically that comes, sometimes have shortness of breath, sometimes it's just an incidental finding the PE, and you have a normal patient, no hypotension, uh, no evidence of right uh, heart strain, and no evidence of myocardial injury. And in the middle, you have a huge um, uh, amount of patients, you know, from all flavors that you can have patients that are hemodynamically stable, but has some signs of right ventricular dilatation, some dysfunction, um, maybe some enlarged right ventricle in the CTA or in the echocardiogram, maybe some changes in the EKG, uh, but you know the presentations are, are completely different in those patients. So that is a little bit of, of a problem. These two, you know, the massive and low risk, I think the treatment is straightforward. In this one is what we have a lot of controversy. So there's other scores that we can use. We can use the PESI score that um, basically the PESI score uh, divides into five categories. You know, you have multiple risk factors that you assign some points. Let's say if you are a male, you have 10 more points. Uh, if you have cancer, heart failure, chronic lung disease, uh, then you have uh, clinical signs at presentations, you know, tachycardia, if your blood pressure is low, uh, et cetera, you know, altermental status. And then you can calculate what is your PACE score. And this is the mortality risk at 30 days. That goes from 1.6 to up to 25%. There is another score that, you know, this score is great, uh, but the thing is takes a little bit of time uh, to calculate. And when you are in, in, in the emergency room or the ICU that you have to go fast, you have something that is easier to 
to, to do it. So then you have the BOVA score that basically um, has uh, four elements. If the patient is hypotensive, you know, with a systolic blood pressure uh, less than 100, you know, or um, I'm sorry, more than 100, between 90 to 100, you give one point or uh, two, zero points or two points. Uh, if you have a tropo elevated troponin, if you have right ventricular dilatation or dysfunction, or if you have an increased uh, heart rate. So depending on the point score, you can have a BOVA1, BOVA2, or BOVA3. And this is the 30-day uh, mortality. However, we found uh, that if, if you have a patient that is a BOVA3 and you add an elevated lactate, you know, this is an important and um, a predictor of mortality in, uh, in, in pulmonary embolism patients. So normally you uh, classify one BOVA1, 2, and 3. In our hospital, we use a lot of the lactate plus the BOVA3 to uh, uh, stratify those patients. So whenever we're talking about right ventricular strain, we can see the right ventricular strain in the um, CT scan. And uh, like in this CT scan, you can see that right ventricle is, is huge. Uh, but what is the sensitivity of the CT scan compared to the echocardiogram? Because sometimes the patient has, uh, do not have or has right ventricular strain in the CT. And they say, why I have to ask for an echocardiogram? The sensitivity of the CT scan for right ventricular strain is about 40%. And the specificity is about, is about 80%. The other problem is that gives you only right ventricular dilatation, but you don't have any idea about the function of the right ventricle. So that's why we always recommend to do an echocardiogram to confirm this. In the echocardiogram, you can have multiple signs like a right ventricular dilatation, right ventricular dysfunction, and there's multiple parameters to evaluate for that. And uh, usually what we do, you know, if you go to the studies, they say, okay, what is the uh, RVLD ratio or uh, TAPSI? And they based the outcomes is just one measurement. What we do here is we try to listen to the, uh, uh, to the cardiologist and say, you know, uh, I think patient has mild, moderate or severe dysfunction, mild, moderate or severe uh, dilatation. One of the signs that we can see when a patient has a, a, a pulmonary embolism is a McConnell sign. And basically McConnell sign is global hypokinesia of the right ventricle and with hyperkinetic uh, apex of the right ventricle. And that gives you an idea that this patient it has a, a, a lot of uh, um, uh, overload of the right ventricle. Uh, the other sign that, or, or the other uh, measurement that we check in the right ventricle is the TAPSI or tricuspid annular plane systolic extrusion. So basically what we do is we measure the distance between the apex and the base uh, and, and how they shorten uh, in the right ventricle. So this distance. And that is to give you an idea of how much the right ventricle contracts. And normal values are above 15 millimeters, 15 millimeters and above. If it's less than 15 millimeters, you can say that patient has um, uh, right ventricular dysfunction. Um, so in our hospital, you know, we found, we did a, a, a chart review and we uh, say, okay, what is the difference between African-American and Caucasian? If you see that in the literature, you know, African-American has an increased mortality uh, compared with Caucasian, but all those cohorts, I'm telling you, is 90% 90, 90 Caucasian, 10% African-American. So we decided to see what happened in our area when we have almost 50-50. So we found uh, about 53% Caucasian and 46% African-American. Uh, if you see, they are not similar, you know, the Caucasians are a little bit older, uh, have more males, um, there is more uh, diabetes in the African-American population, more cr chronic kidney disease. Um, uh, there are more smokers um, and uh, they have more trauma and uh, in, the, in, the, in the Caucasian and more surgeries also in the Caucasians. So and when we saw the presentation of the right ventricle, it was quite interesting because, you know, uh, African-American have more underfilled 
left ventricle that you remember when I was talking about the pathophysiology, you say that you decrease the pre-love of the, of the left ventricle. So that occur more often in African-American than Caucasian, but also the right ventricle, you know, uh, Cau uh, Caucasian has more normal right ventricle than African-American, but African-American has a more dilated right ventricle and more a severe dilated right ventricle are more severe dysfunction when we compare with Caucasian. We think this might be related because of comorbidities, uh, but when we compare about the mortality, uh, there was no different in a, the whole mortality between Caucasian and African-American. However, in those patients that require advanced therapies, I'm talking about systemic thrombolytics, um, catheter-based interventions, surgery, there was a higher mortality uh, among African-Americans was 18.5 versus 3.8. So this is something that we need to look into a little bit more, uh, but it's an interesting finding that I'd like to share. So now we're gonna talk about treatment. You know, what kind of treatments we can offer to uh, patients with pulmonary embolism? We have uh, a lot of options right now. And it's not only that we have one or two anticoagulants, we have like six, seven different anticoagulants. And we have a lot of advanced, advanced therapies that, uh, you know, are in the market. So we, we, we have to talk about that. So uh, I'm talking about anticoagulation. We have unfractionated heparin. If we, you know, it still is a great drug. We use it a lot, especially when we have a patient in the hospital that, that we don't know if we're really going to do an advanced therapy or not. We have low molecular weight heparin. You, we use it a lot. And if you have a patient that has any we call allergy to the heparins or heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. We have other options like argatroban, bivalidudine, and even we can use fondaparinox in those patients. For long-term treatment, we have a, like a, a vitamin K antagonist like a warfarin. You know, it's still a really, really good drug, you know, um, but we have the new drugs also like apixaban, rivaroxaban, edoxaban that are anti tene a inhibitors, or we have direct thrombin inhibitor like a dabigatran. So if you think, and this is a busy slide, I, I, I'm sorry for this. This is the coagulation cascade, the anticoagulation system and the thrombolytic system. And we know that like a, in, in the case of warfarin, we know that warfarin works in several steps of the coagulation cascade and uh, apixaban, edoxaban, uh, you know, they work in one specific factor. So uh, just keep that in mind, you know, the new drugs are really good. Uh, I use it a lot, but there is still room for the old medicines like warfarin. Um, Tips about anticoagulation. If you suspect that patient has antiphospholipid antibodies and, or if you suspect that your patient has a not reliable APTT, just switch the patient uh, for anti-10A. Uh, activity, you know, it's not uh, reliable to follow those patients with APDT. When is heparin resistant? We do require a lot of heparin. Let's say you have a patient that is requiring 60,000 units a day, 80,000 units a day, and you still don't have any uh, changes in the APDT. Okay, maybe you have to check the patient, you have to switch the patient to anti 10 a and if the anti a is still not therapeutic, you have a true resi resistant to heparin. So maybe you have to switch to a different anticoagulant. And also, as I said before, if you suspect heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, uh, maybe uh, you have to switch the patient to a different anticoagulant. Also for low molecular weight heparin, if you suspect that patient has HIT, uh, you have to switch to uh, a different anticoagulant. And also you have to check anti a uh, once in a while in patients with, uh, that you are using low molecular weight heparin, especially if you have a patient that has a borderline kidney function, uh, patient that have like a borderline obesity, you have to think that for a low molecular weight heparin, the cutoff weight is about 150 kilos. If you have somebody in that weight, maybe it's a good idea to check anti 10 a as well. Also in the underweight patients, you know, if you have a patient that is really thin, um, maybe it's a good idea also to check uh, anti 10 a um, Fondaparinox is uh, mainly used for heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. And argatroban and bivalirudin, almost the same. Um, 
Vitamin K antagonists, just remember, now maybe uh, the, the new physicians, they have all these new medicines, and I have these uh, questions on and off. Uh, how about breaching of, uh, of warfarin? You know, you still have to breach warfarin. And uh, usually you have to breach warfarin for at least five days. Just remember that... Um, the factor 10 and factor two are the factors with the longest uh, health life. So they takes up to uh, three, four days uh, to suppress. Uh, and the first thing that you suppress when you give a vitamin K antagonist is protein C and protein S that is your anticoagulant system. So the first two, three days that you give vitamin K antagonist, you cause a hyper uh, coagulant state. So that's why you have to bridge these patients with a, a, a different anticoagulant. Um, DOACs, DOACs are really good, uh, but avoid using DOACs when you have a patient with a confirmed antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, especially if you have with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome for lupus anticoagulant, uh, um, where is two or three uh, antiphospholipid, cardiolipin and beta-2 glycoprotein. You know, there is a study that is a TRAPS trial that they found that the patients that were treated with rivaroxaban, they bleed much more and they thrombose much more uh, than those patients treated with warfarin. So be careful with antifospholipid antibodies and DOACs. Uh, those patients that has poor absorption, just these drugs, the DOACs uh, absorb in the, uh, in, the, um, in the stomach and the uh, proximal duodenum. So those patients with gastric by bypass, especially ROCs and Y, you know, they probably have a decreased absorption of DOACs. Uh, patients with Crohn's disease, uh, patients with large bowel resections, just think about that kind of patients. And uh, in hemodialysis patients, interesting, there's a bunch of information outside about VT anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation in patients uh, using DOACs. And the results are really good, but there's no information about a, a hemodialysis patients and venous thromboembolism. So we can extrapolate the, um, the information from the studies from AFib, but there's no studies dedicated for hemodialysis patients and venous thromboembolism. I think there are a couple of studies uh, that are, uh, you know, running right now, but um, that is something that we have to be careful. And uh, morbid obesity, uh, there is still some controversy about morbid obesity. There is some, um, at, in the early ages of DOACs, you know, there was a statement that was not safe uh, to use a DOACs in morbid obese patients. Later, another study shows that, uh, you know, there was no events when they use uh, DOACs in patients with BMIs more than 40. So uh, I personally, I use uh, DOACs in morbid obese patients, but there's no good data about that neither. Um, Advanced therapies. Anybody has any questions uh, so far? No? Okay. So um, we go to advanced therapies. What is advanced therapies? We're going to talk about systemic thrombolytics. We're going to talk about catheter-based interventions that now is not only thrombolysis. We have a catheter thrombectomy. Um, we're going to talk about surgical pulmonary embolectomy. And we're going to talk about advanced cardiovascular support. Here at the University of Maryland, we have the ECMO program that uh, we have a lot of patients. So uh, let me start with this. Um, this is one, you know, from the analysis that we did at the University of Maryland, we use uh, about, you know, 75%, um, 76% of patients that require with pulmonary embolism, they require only anticoagulation. About 11% of patients, we couldn't offer any treatment uh, for multiple reasons. And about 15% of patients require some kind of advanced therapies. And if you see most of the advanced therapies that we use was a surgical pulmonary embolectomy and catheter-based interventions, we use some ECMO and very few systemic thrombolysis alone. And, um, but also we have a lot of combinations like systemic thromboly uh, thrombolysis plus a surgical pulmonary embolectomy, uh, systemic thrombolysis, plus catheter-based interventions, uh, plus VA ECMO, et cetera. So I'm gonna talk about those. Uh, systemic thrombolytics, we know that they work. There's multiple trials that they, they have done in the past. I'm gonna quote this meta-analysis that was done in 2015. 
And uh, in this meta-analysis, they, uh, they, they see, you know, they put all the patients together and they found that overall mortality improved when you use thrombolytics in those patients. You know, it favors the use of thrombolytics versus anticoagulation alone. Whenever they divide uh, these in those patients that were stable, you know, they divide the unstable PEs versus the stable PE, they found, you know, they just lost um, uh, statistical significance with a P0.08, you know, but still, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a bad idea. Uh, but when they found about bleeding, you know, all the studies, they show that thrombolytics increase your risk of bleeding. So what, uh, the, uh, what the guidelines say, you know, if you have a patient who has an, uh, uh, an acute pulmonary embolism that is unstable, we're talking about hypotension, you know, and they do not have a high risk of bleeding, you can use thrombolytics. You know, if you have a patient that is stable, you know, the guidelines do not uh, recommend thrombolytics. Uh, because the patient is completely stable. However, if you have a patient that is stable now, but you start seeing uh, signs and symptoms that patients deteriorating, you might uh, uh, give systemic thrombolytics to those patients. And when I, uh, you know, this is one of the talks that I have with, uh, with the people here. Here at the University of Maryland, we have ECMO, we have many other resources, but if we have a patient that they are requesting for transfer and the patient is, is far away, say, you know, if the patient is unstable or is becoming unstable, just give thrombolytics. Don't wait for that. Uh, give one shot of, of TPA and then send the patient because we, uh, this, this can save lives. So um, now we're going to talk about catheter direct therapies. And this is a really hot topic right now. There is multiple products outside. However, even believe it or not, there is only few good uh, level uh, of data. And I summarize this data uh, in this um, uh, table. And believe it or not, this is the only randomized control trial that we have. Um, that was the ultima trial that was published in 2014. It includes 59 patients only, you know, that's the only randomized trial and the uh, outcomes, you know, was the RVLV ratio improvement at 24 hours. If you see, you know, there was a statistically significant improvement of the RVLV ratio with the uh, ultrasound, uh, catheter ultrasound uh, guided therapy. And, um, you know, with an acceptable bleeding and acceptable uh, mortality, it was no different, difference in that. All the other studies, the Seattle, perfect, uh, flare and exact trials, those are single arm. This is a registry single arm. They do not include any uh, uh, control uh, patients. Uh, the Optilize PE trial, it was randomized to different doses of uh, thrombolytics, but there was no control patients. There were no patients that were uh, given just anticoagulation, you know. Uh, the flare is uh, with a different catheter. This is a flow trigger from Inari. It's a single arm uh, trial. And also they extract PE uh, with a penumbra catheter. That is also a single arm trial. So we cannot say that we have a strong evidence in favor or against these uh, catheters because there is not enough information. So what, uh, in, uh, you know, the AHA, they released a scientific statement in 2019 that says the current data shows that catheter-based therapies improve surrogate outcomes, such as right ventricular dysfunction improvement uh, in acute pulmonary embolism. But currently they cannot support uh, the, the use as a, uh, you know, 1A indication for patients with uh, pulmonary embolism. They say they might uh, benefit long-term complications like a chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, but it's, there's no good data yet. So uh, I know that if you go to uh, any hospital and many people are going to think, okay, let's take the patient to a catheter-based uh, intervention. Let's say we, let's use ECOS catheter or Inari uh, thrombectomy, but 
what are the real consequences of using that if you increase your risk of mortality when you are in the hospital? Or what is the real benefit, the long-term benefit of those interventions? So um, that, that is one thing. Now I'm gonna talk about um, uh, surgical pulmonary embolectomy. Uh, surgical pulmonary embolectomy is used when you have a massive pulmonary embolism that is refractory to other treatments. Uh, let's say if you try pulmonary embolectomy, you, I'm sorry, you try catheter-based interventions, the patient is not doing, doing well, maybe you can uh, call the surgeons, hey, uh, you know, we need to do a pulmonary embolectomy in this patient. When you have a patient that has a clot in transit, that is an indication to do a pulmonary embolectomy. When you have a clot in transit and a patent for amino valley, that is another indication. Patients uh, with acute and chronic pulmonary embolism, but this is more an indication for a pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. Uh, that is a more complicated surgery. When you have a patient with a thrombus in the right ventricle or right, right atrium, and this is a very soft, but maybe I have seen this like a once or twice that you have a patient who have a pulmonary embolism, but also they are scheduled to have cabbage or uh, valve replacement. They take the patient to the OR and they do uh, the, the, the two surgeries at the same time. So when in our hospital, you know, what is our data from our hospital? So there is two uh, big, uh, start, well, case series. Uh, one is from uh, Brigham and Woman, the other one's from University of Maryland. And from Brigham and Woman, they show about <clears throat> 115 surgical embolectomies uh, during 14 years. We had about 50, 55 during four years. And the 30 day mortality was, I can say, very similar. Also one year mortality was a little bit different, but I think the patients were not exactly the same. And the 30 day mortality was very, very similar. And the difference here is that in our series was a lot of patients who required a, 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 for the, the surgery for acute and chronic. So we're a little bit more stable patients. But now what is the best treatment? Uh, what will you use for your patients? So catheter-based interventions, um, we, we, we did this analysis and uh, what happened is we compare all the patients that received catheter-based interventions that were about uh, 30 patients in our center and we did a propensity score match and we match with patients who receive medical therapy, just anticoagulation versus a surgical a pulmonary a, a embolectomy. So what we found is that this patient was not, the, and, and we compare over time, we went up to two years you know, of follow-ups. We use CRISP to try to get all the data from other hospitals. And we found there was no difference in thrombus resolution in those patients. Uh, the patients who receive catheter-based interventions versus uh, um, surgical and medicine approaches, there was no difference in improvement of the right ventricular the dysfunction recovery. All patients recovered that. The length of the stay was a little bit longer in the surgical arm. So those patients that received surgical pulmonary embolectomy stay a little bit longer than the other patients. And there was an increased uh, risk of bleeding in patients who received catheter-based intervention group. So when we draw a Kaplan-Meier for mortality, we can see in the top, those are the patients who receive surgical pulmonary embolectomy. And we can see uh, everybody else, I'm sorry, we can see the uh, patients with catheter-based interventions in blue. You can see that there's <clears throat> a, a difference here. But when we compare the catheter-based interventions with the patients who receive medical group, that is the yellow line, there was almost no difference in mortality between uh, catheter-based interventions versus the medical group. One of the critiques of this study is most, most of the patients who receive catheter-based interventions, they receive is an, a catheter-based thrombolysis with an ECOS catheter. There was only one patient who received a, a, a catheter a thrombectomy. Now in the market, we have the Inari catheter that they use catheter-based thrombectomies, and, but we, not, we need to check the data in the future. But that's why it's important to do a comparison between medical therapy and catheter-based interventions. Um, how about extracorporeal membrane oxygenation or ECMO? This is a patient that we have on ECMO. We have a, an arterial and a venous cannula, and we have 
the patients can even walk while they are on ECMO. And now during this pandemic, ECMO has been used a lot, especially in, in those COVID patients. So we use uh, ECMO in our PE patients. And uh, a couple of years ago, Dr. Khan uh, published this case series of about 20 patients uh, who received ECMO for treatment of massive pulmonary embolism. And um, there is another group from Europe that they also use ECMO in massive pulmonary embolism. And what we found is the outcomes for them, they, they report about 61% uh, mortality. And in our patients was about 5% mortality. And this difference is explained not because of the technique, not because of the equipment, is basically the selection of patients. We found that if we have a patient that is more than 65 or 70 years old, is not a good candidate for ECMO because almost everybody dies uh, if you put them on ECMO. Uh, we found that if you have a patient who has a bad uh, disease, let's say it's a cancer patient, you know, they, or a cancer uh, in a late stage, you know, uh, they usually, we don't use the ECMO in those patients because uh, we know that mortality will not be good. Uh, so we have to be careful on which patients we select uh, to put them on ECMO. Um, so we did a couple of things while patient is on ECMO. One of the things that we saw is uh, in few patients that we had before that we tried the catheter-based interventions, whenever they come from the other hospital and we try to put the patient in the, in the OR, we put the catheter in, the patient decompensates and the patients sometimes end up, end up in ECMO. So um, we say, okay, maybe those patients that are high risk is not a good idea to use catheter-based interventions because they can go worse. So, but that's why if we stabilize the patient on ECMO and then we try the catheter-based intervention. So we did couple patients before and we did this, I think it was six patients only, but we found that all those patients with massive pulmonary embolism that they were on ECMO, we found 100% survival in those patients. None of the patients require a tracheostomy None of the patients require dialysis after the therapy. None of the patients develop uh, a stroke, but they all require much more blood transfusion. So uh, again, this was with uh, ECOS catheter with direct catheter direct thrombolysis was not with catheter based thrombectomy. So there is a room for research in that area. You know, if you have a patient with massive pulmonary embolism, maybe we can use ECMO plus catheter-based interventions. There is another question. Why if I gave systemic thrombolytics to my patients and then I put them on ECMO, what, are the patients doing well or not? So we found in about um, 80 something patients that were on ECMO during, um, um, I think it was from 2017 to 2019, uh, those patients were on ECMO for PE. And about 18 of those patients had received previous um, systemic thrombolytics. And we want to see what, what is the outcomes, you know, if the patients die more or not, because uh, usually we put them on ECMO because there was a failure uh, of systemic thrombolytics. So we found that, uh, the, interestingly, um, the survival to discharge in, that, in those patients was a little bit better in the patients who received systemic thrombolytics and then require ECMO was 88.9 versus 84.6, but was no statistical difference. However, you know, they require way more blood transfusions. You know, the mayor bleeding was 61.1% in patients who received previous systemic thrombolytics versus 26% in those that did not receive systemic thrombolytics. But, you know, it's mortality outcomes was, was okay. Um, let me see. Then which therapy is better? And that is a million question, a million dollar question. And when I came here uh, to the University of Maryland, there was a lot of controversy between services because we don't have a good data. And still, I think we don't have a good data for that. So let me tell you a little bit of history. Uh, let me see. Okay, a long time ago in 2018, PERT was created in the middle of the battle between medical rebels and the surgical empire to treat PE. 
As a result, an algorithm was created to uh, keep the peace between services. So uh, this is the algorithm that we use at the University of Maryland. And uh, after I present all the data that I show it to you, uh, we decide uh, to work better with an algorithm. Uh, so after we diagnose the pulmonary embolism, you know, we see if the patient is stable or unstable. So we have the express curve per activation that we activate only if we have a moderate risk patient that has a submassive, um, high risk a submassive, a BOBA3, or if you have a massive patient. If you have a patient with a massive pulmonary embolism or a high risk BOBA, I was telling you, you know, here most of the time we use BOBA plus lactate. We uh, usually put an access for ECMO in those patients. In massive PE, we connect the ECMO. In the uh, high-risk BOVA3, we use micro um, puncture only, and we just leave the access, but we don't put the cannulas. Uh, if we have a massive patient, we can use uh, um, systemic thrombolytics plus minus ECMO, or we can use ECMO plus minus catheter-based interventions. Um, then we put the patient on ICU for cardiovascular support. Whenever you have a patient that is a high risk or moderate risk, we, uh, we usually don't do any intervention at this time. We repeat the echocardiogram at 48 hours. And if we, we see if the patient has a clinical improvement or not. Uh, why 48 hours? Usually if you see other guidelines, they take this patient right away to catheter-based interventions. But uh, what we found is what is really the benefit to rush a patient uh, for the catheter-based intervention? Most of these patients that we repeat the echocardiogram at 48 hours, we start seeing an improvement of the right ventricle function. And, uh, you know, the function is what really recovers faster than the dilatation. The patients remain with RV dilated for a couple of days. But at 48 hours, we see that the patients start getting better. And most of the time, the patients do not require an intervention. However, if patient doesn't get doesn't improve, then we have to see if the patient is a surgical candidate or not. And if the patient, in fact, is a surgical candidate, we evaluate the patient for either catheter-based interventions or surgical pulmonary embolectomy. When we talk about catheter-based interventions, you know, um, everybody thinks about a, a myocardial infarction. You know, in myocardial infarction, you have uh, you have some goals in time between when the patient comes to the hospital. You have a door to balloon time, etc. In pulmonary embolism, is not right equal to that. Uh, whenever you see, you have up to fourteen days to do a thrombolysis in those patients, uh, and it's successful. So as long as the patient is not unstable, you have some time to plan your intervention. You don't have to rush the patient to the OR. Um, also, you know, for surgical pulmonary embolectomy, if the patient is in this area that is on ECMO, you can also plan the, the pulmonary embolectomy because you have time, the time is given by ECMO. Uh, then if you, uh, if the patient has a clinical improvement, you just start a patient on anticoagulation and then you discharge the patient. And we have the pulmonary embolism clinic uh, uh, in the outpatient clinic. On the other hand, if you have a patient that is completely stable, that is low risk, uh, you can either observe the patient or you can even send the patient home from the emergency room if they have a low risk of bleeding and low uh, social profile. You know, the patient is reliable, basically. Um, now I'm going to talk about what consequences you have after having a pulmonary embolism. Uh, not everybody goes well. You know, you have a PE, about 50% of patients after a pulmonary embolism have some kind of dysfunction. And this is based on the uh, trial from Dr. Susan Kahn, um, that is the ELOP trial. They found that 50, uh, 48.5 patient of, uh, of patients uh, after a pulmonary embolism, they develop a shortness of breath, you know, they don't have a good quality of life. And when you check the echocardiogram, they don't have a normal right ventricle, you know, they have maybe mild uh, RV dilatation, mild dysfunction. Um, they can have also an abnormal a VQ scan, or they have an abnormal, still significant residual thrombus in the CT scan. If you do um, 
a pulmonary function test, you see the gas exchange is not the best. You ask the patient to, to walk and, and, and you don't have a normal uh, walking test, like a six minute walking test. And you say, hmm, this patient might drop into the post pulmonary embolism syndrome. And this, basic, this is basically a, like a new term. We don't know exactly the why this occurs, why some patients uh, develop post-PE syndrome, why patients do not develop post-PE syndrome. Uh, when they try to check if the, uh, uh, the, the residual thrombus has something to do with this, uh, this was not related to the residual thrombus. So we are still looking in this area to see what's going on. We don't have a pathophysiology for this post-PE syndrome, but that occurs in our patients. But if we see what is the uh, worst case of post pulmonary embolic syndrome? We talk about chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. In chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, we see significant residual clot in the pulmonary artery uh, that could be proximal, like in type one or type two, or could be distal in type three and type four. And uh, those patients uh, not only have residual uh, thrombus, they also have increased pulmonary pressure. And this patient come with a pulmonary pressure of 50, 60, and they, they have signs of right ventricular dysfunction or failure. Um, you, you need to have at least one pulmonary embolism, but up to 60% of the people do not remember having a pulmonary embolism. Um, the mortality, if you don't treat this, is about 70% if your pulmonary artery pressure is more than 40, and 90% if your pulmonary artery pressure is more than 50, and you don't treat those patients. Uh, those patients are usually treated with surgical uh, pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. You have to go and remove those clots, and you can use medicines to increase uh, to, to decrease the pulmonary uh, pressure as well. When we did, a, we, check, we, we tried to check why these patients do not have a complete resolution of the clot. So we did an analysis of our, of our population and we found about 350 patients that has some a, a kind of images after pulmonary embolism. They have either a CT scan or a VQ scan after APE. And we found that almost one third of the patients do not not resolve the clot. And um, the risk factors for an incomplete thrombus resolution were a, a history of cancer. If they have a concomitant lower extremity DVT, and also if they were a uh, non-Caucasian by race, you know, uh, the patients who remove, to, who resolve the clot really fast were those patients that had a provoked event such as a after surgery or trauma. So those patients resolve really, really fast. So this is another interesting area that we are working on right now. So uh, post-PE care, what we do when patient has a pulmonary embolism, we need to check for thrombus resolution images. Um, we usually do is a VQ scan. Um, uh, we don't repeat CT scans all the time. Um, also, we do a, an echocardiogram to see if they normalize the right ventricular function. You know, uh, I usually see patients after a month, uh, but I send all these tests between one month and three months. Uh, some, uh, as I told you, the right ventricular systolic function uh, normalizes in almost all the patients. Uh, the problem is some of the patients remain with a right ventricular dilatation. Uh, also, we do a six-minute walking test to see what is the exercise tolerance on those patients. Um, a, a doctor can, in, he, in her trial, they show that a, an abnormal uh, peak VO2 measure, they, they, they use six minute walking test um, and, and, and they use also cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And an abnormal uh, uh, peak VO2 that is less than 80% of predicted uh, is a good predictor that the patient can develop post-PE syndrome. Also, if you think that the patient, uh, you know, still have the shortness of breath and you don't know what's going on, you can also send a pulmonary function test. Maybe the patient has any other, uh, like a COPD or any other uh, uh, um, lung disease that uh, you haven't been, the patient hasn't been diagnosed before. So those are the usually post-PE care that we see. Sometimes we have to change uh, uh, anticoagulants. Let's say you have a patient that you do the, uh, the VQ scan at three months and the patient is not only that hasn't resolved the clot, the patient having new clots. Maybe the anticoagulant that you are using is not appropriate for the patient. You have to switch to a different anticoagulant. Um, 
sometimes we have to think about a filter. But you know, those are the things that you you will you will see in your in your uh, patient after EPE. So uh, in summary, the correct risk stratification is key to apply the most appropriate treatment. Um, you have to be a very familiar with what you have in your hospital. You have ECMO, you have a, a cath lab, you have a, a, a cardiac surgeons on call, you know, or if you don't have that, you know, you have to be familiar to use a systemic thrombolysis, thrombolysis or you can refer the patient to another hospital. Uh, if you have a patient with massive PE, you don't have time. You have to treat the patient right away. And if you have a patient that is stable, you know, you can use other therapies. Gather-based interventions are a great tool, but we don't have enough information yet. So uh, we use it, but not as much as we used before. Uh, we are very cautious with cardiovascular intervention. And uh, I recommend to have a post-PE care in every single PE patient because what you don't want is that a patient comes at six months and they have severe shortness of breath and then uh, you find that patient has chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension and something that you might uh, you know, uh, intervene earlier in the disease. Uh, 